for tuning into Power Athlete Radio. These days, contact sports, namely football, are on the chopping block for their propensity to cause serious brain injury. Luckily, Fred Willis has stepped in as an advocate for players and is dedicated to combating the machine that pumps out TBIs, CTEs, and undiagnosed concussions any given Sunday. A former NFL veteran, Willis considers himself lucky to have the capacity to fight for those athletes who have suffered from not only their irreversible head trauma, but from being ostracized by the very institution that employs them. No matter your opinion on whether the NFL owes these players anything, one thing is for sure. Hearing Willis speak of the complex politics surrounding the issues reminds us that these men really are the gladiators of our time and deserve treatment. This is episode 201. Power Athlete Nation. It's that time again. You have Luke and John sitting around our kitchen table in uh, in. We'll call it Austin. Well, until we build a proper office, which we're right, in the process. Right. I mean, if it wasn't raining so much, we probably already would have had a proper office. But in the meantime, we're here from, you know, Austin proper. Yeah. And then uh, we have Tex, who's over in uh, what uh, Astros, Astro City, Superdome City. What is it, Tex? Crush City. Crush City. Or, I, thought it was Cl- I thought it was Clap City. I don't know what you're talking about, but, but oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Let's, let's, let's roll. All right. Well, anyways, we are giving you another episode of the premier podcast in strength and conditioning. (laughs) I can't believe we have a fact. This is amazing. Yeah, that's it. So it's official. All right. And we have a special guest. We're going to be talking, as you guys know, John, uh, anyone who's listened to more than four or five of our podcasts knows that John is a 10-year NFL veteran, 100 career starts, 10 playoff appearances, went to Cal Berkeley, rhetoric major, enjoys the classics, super intelligent individual. But, which is um, a lot a lot of that John has in common with our guest today, right? So, John, tell us about who we got going. Yeah, I mean, I was really excited to, to uh, connect with Fred Willis. Uh, Fred's a former NFL player and has really been spearheading um, the effects of not only concussions and CTE and really the lawsuit that's, uh, you know, between the players and the NFL, uh, you know, concerning – you know, the, uh, I guess you could say, like the misinformation and really just the, uh, you know, all out just bad etiquette of the NFL where yeah. not only would they, uh, you know, keep information, but they really classify things off and, you know, and uh, people are been damaged. And, uh, you know, if the NFL had done the right thing and really given lifetime medical benefits to a lot of these guys, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation, but unfortunately they didn't. So there's a uh, concussion lawsuit. And for those of you guys that are, you know, seeing in the news, this is pretty prevalent. And, uh, you know, how I got connected with Fred, um, I'm on an email uh, list and just was getting hit with a lot of information by Fred about not only the concussions, what was going on, and he does a great job of keeping ex-players really abreast of the situation at hand. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of guys just aren't educated on it, and you know Fred's been deep in this fight, so I uh, reached out to Fred um, about you know getting on the phone, talking, and starting to understand a little bit more. And then life ha- happened, and you know we moved to Texas, and you know that kind of got put off. And you know I was sitting a, at a coffee shop working, and one of his emails came through, and I hit him up and said, "Hey, man, we were supposed to have a conversation." So we jumped on the phone for about an hour and a half, and he not only explained to me the situation uh, concerning the lawsuit and what was really going on in terms of both time, uh, both sides with the you know, legal teams that were supposedly defending the players in the lawsuit, the NFL, the settlement, what was happening within the courts. And um, he's got some really interesting stuff that he's been putting forth in terms of treatments to help ex-NFL players or people that, you know, might be dealing with, uh, you know, the concussion syndrome. So, uh, you know, my natural thought after the conversation was to get Fred on a podcast, on a podcast yeah. and really just have a recording where if, uh, you know, ex-NFL players or people have questions about this, they can download this episode of Power Athlete Radio and hopefully get them all answered. And then also, you know, get a good introduction to Fred and, you know, potentially, uh, you know, have him as a resource that they can reach out to. So we're just doing a little bit of a community service and um, hopefully helping guys Mm -hmm. uh, navigate these extremely muddy waters because uh, like I said, I'd like to believe I'm a fairly intelligent person, or super intelligent, however you want to put it. And it's even confusing for me. I mean, I, uh, you know, I've been going through uh, a bunch of the, you know, not only legal docs, but information that I've been getting sent by the lawyers because I'm involved in the settlement as well in the the lawsuit. And it's, um, uh, it's cryptic and it's confusing and it doesn't make a lot of sense. And I think, you know, as a, you know, a defendant in this deal, the big question is, okay, it's settled. Now, 
how do I potentially get into this thing to either get some benefits or get mm -hmm. some help? So I think, um, you know, Fred can not only give us history on not only the uh, effects of CTE, uh, the settlement, um, you know, really the case, you know, what's kind of transpired, and then also give us some ideas on treatments and how we can help and necessarily some numbers and some places for ex players to, to reach out to in case they're having problems. So Fred, I mean, uh, you know, you, you said you have a, a, I guess about you said seven years in the NFL. You're involved in the NFLPA. Uh, you've got an organization, NFL Players Brains Matter. Uh, you're you, and you've been in this fight for a while. So I think what we'll do now is just hand you the mic and uh, you know give us some background on yourself uh, and and what do you want to talk about? I mean, we talked quite a bit pre-show. This is your platform. Let's get the message out. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, I I you know I think that the key here is. Um, Trying to get the message out to to our to our brothers, you know we we have a very very strong brotherhood. Uh, guys have played in the NFL. Uh, it's it's a very unique brotherhood that we have. Uh, and um, you know I've chosen to be sort of a voice uh, for the brotherhood and and uh, have uh, my background is about uh, five years ago I decided to. Uh, get involved in, in this, uh, trying to look for a possible diagnosis, uh, a treatment, actually a treatment for post-concussion syndrome. Uh, I live in Boston <clears throat> and I got to know this Robert Stern at Boston University pretty well as, as a colleague and friend. And uh, Dr. Stern is the, in his group, for the people who have been doing the autopsies on players who have committed suicide and and players who have passed away um, since this all started. Uh, so um, I gained a lot of knowledge uh, from him about this and chose to uh, look at this situation as far as the brotherhood is concerned. And it, it seemed to me at the time that um, a lot of people were interested uh, from either a professional standpoint or a financial standpoint of looking into diagnosing CTE. And um, certainly Bob Stern is at the forefront of this. Um, you, you know, he just got an $18 million grant from NIH to continue his work on tau protein and trying to spot tau protein, which is the uh, nature of the, the disease, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, uh, in players uh, before autopsy. So uh, I heard a lot of talk about, you know, trying to diagnose CTE, uh, you know, and my, my own personal feeling was I think the Brotherhood would really want to know how they get better with this disease and not so much somebody all of a sudden coming up after they spend $18 million to tell them they have CTE. Um, the statistics out of, out of, from Stern uh, recently have said that 95% uh, of anybody who play, any player who played in the NFL will come down with chronic traumatic encephalopathy, 95%. Now, that, that research is based on the large number of autopsies he's done on NFL players and football players who have either committed suicide or passed away. So uh, it's, it's a staggering statistic. So the chances of us having CTE are 95%. Now, we have to live with this disease uh, every day. And, and the, the results of this disease and the symptoms of this disease are devastating for, the brother, for our players, the brotherhood. I mean, the... Uh, this drives the players to alcohol addiction, drug addiction. We've seen the history of players who have committed suicide. Uh, the, uh, basically, the results are pretty much the same for all of them. Where they've, in the end, where they've committed suicide at that time, they were broke, addicted, and homeless, or separated from family. So, you know, we know the insidious nature of this disease and what it can do to us. So that's why I chose to get on the treatment side of it. And uh, you said it was about five years ago. What was what was the driving force? I mean, when did you well, decide, hey, I'm going to... It, it's kind of an interesting reason. Um, about eight years ago, I was uh, 
I wasn't feeling well and I was diagnosed with, uh, I, I actually went to the doctor and, and I was diagnosed with end stage liver disease, uh, which was pretty shocking. Uh, huh. And I was told uh, eight years ago that uh, unless I had a liver transplant, that, uh, you know, that was it. So um, I was placed on a, a liver transplant list and, and waited uh, about three years for uh, a transplant, uh, which I eventually did receive. But interestingly, the, the, um, the situation I was in uh, eight years ago was about, you know, was about the time that the suicide, we started seeing these suicides from NFL players and, uh, uh, you know, uh, at, literally at the same time that I was diagnosed, all of a sudden I started seeing this stuff of guy, of players killing themselves and all this other stuff. And, you know, we heard about Mike Webster and, and then eventually Bennett Amalu who came into play and, and how this seemed to grow. But uh, my situation was uh, personally that the symptoms that, that I had something called hepatic encephalopathy. Uh, those symptoms are the same symptoms that uh, NFL players who committed suicide had with chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So um, the, the symptoms were the same, um, you know, where uh, almost uh, parallel to what I saw was happening with, with players uh, when they found out why they committed suicide and, and the experiences they were going through behavior wise. So actually uh, a lot of patients who uh, are waiting on liver transplant. The suicide rate is 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 pretty uh, pretty large because they don't want to deal with hepatic encephalopathy. So what that means is when um, the uh, liver shuts down, uh, it can't process ammonia in your body. So the ammonia goes directly to your brain, and it causes uh, full blown dementia. So for about three years, I experienced uh, full blown dementia. There is, there is a way to offset it um, in that, uh, you know, you have to basically uh, go to the bathroom, uh, take a laxative and go to the bathroom all day and you oh, stretch gosh. on the toilet. It's not comfortable at all. So anyway, that's the only way to get the ammonia out. So anyway, I, w I went through a full-blown experience with dementia and just similarly, uh, all of a sudden I see, see the same things happen to our guys that were committing suicide and I say, that, that's me. So that's why I chose to eventually, uh, when I got better and decided I'd be around to see if I could, because of the experience I had, to, to see if I could give something back. And uh, you know, I've been successful as a businessman, uh, done a lot of things in business, uh, and chose to delve in, you know, do, really jump into this big time. So, you know, uh, we've come a long way with, with this treatment we're, we're having. Um, my company, HBN Neurologic, is basically markets this device that I acquired. It's an FDA device we use for treatment. We market it all over the world to mental health professionals. So, um, you know, thank goodness that company is, is thriving and doing well. And, you know, a lot of, uh, I pour money back from that company into treating players. Over the last few years, we've treated players pro bono. Uh, I just finished a self-funded uh, two-year clinical trial study uh, with players out of Tampa, Florida um, that showed uh, tremendous results with this treatment. So we've come a long way with it. Uh, my plan is to have uh, treatment teams set up in cities around the country when the lawsuit finally settles uh, to treat players. And this, I guess that's why this is kind of timely, right, John? Because there's, we're finally kind of seeing the horizon on this thing. Because how long yeah. has this, the lawsuit been in play? I mean, I think, uh, you know, next to four or five years, I remember. Five uh, years, yeah. yeah. Five years, I remember, uh, you know, first being contacted actually by Kyle Turley about it. And, uh, you know, the idea where, you know, we don't necessarily know what's happening. And I remember thinking to myself, uh, um, you know, and the the irony of this is when I first came in the NFL, I remember distinctively talking with the, uh, the doctor and they were going through a whole deal and they said, you know, you know, you'll get a concussion when you're not unconscious. And I was like, Oh, okay. So 
if uh, you know I'm not knocked if you know not knocked unconscious, I don't have a concussion. And they were like, no, 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 um, that's how you'll know. So then the hilarious part is fast forward to 2007, 2008. I remember a similar conversation when they reclassified it, and they said, you know, you'll know you'll have a concussion if you hit your head and you feel disoriented at any time. You hear a ringing, your eyes cross, maybe your vision blurs. And I, I remember thinking to myself, man, that, uh, that's really a strange re, uh, reclassification. And then ironically, um, shortly after I retired, uh, living in Newport beach, I got reached out to, to be in Dr. Amon's, uh, you know, uh, brain study. He was, uh, you know, analyzing ex NFL players. And when one of their questions, when they came in, they said, uh, how many concussions do you think you've had? And I was like, well, do you want the 1999 uh, diagnosis or do you want the 2008 diagnosis? And they were like, well, what was that? And I, I told them the same story. I'm like, well, I've never been knocked unconscious. And then they asked me, well, based off of 2008, how many concussions you've had? And I'm like, I don't know, maybe 40, 50, 60,000. I mean, you know, you got to figure like we played. How many, yeah, how many practice snaps? And Well, I mean, you got to figure like, okay, you had 60, 70 plays per game, um, you know, and then you figure you probably had, you know, two or 300 reps per, per practice. And you look at training camp, double days, and you go through these numbers. And you're like, you know, would it make sense that you had 6,000 uh, potential head contacts during a season and over 10 years? I mean, you know, would you say 60,000 was fair? And we kind of went back and did the math and they were like, man, that's a, uh, it's a pretty high number of traumatic brain injury. And they were like, you know, I was like, well, not every time I hit, did I feel disoriented, but there was probably 20, 30% of those where, you know, you're putting, you're basically driving your head through somebody and you walk back to the huddle and you're looking, you know, blinking your eyes. Or, you know, I remember one guy I played with told me uh, during a play, he's like, dude, I can't see out of my left eye. And I remember thinking like, it's pretty bad. And, uh, but, uh, you know, that's the nature of which you came in. And I think the NFL and part of the reason that the concussion lawsuit has been, you know, somewhat successful thus far is, you know, players weren't made aware of the potential for these things. Cause I mean, either they, they knew when they covered it up or they didn't know, or they didn't want to know. But I remember, uh, you know, the information that we were being told was not accurate. And I think a big part of this thing is, uh, you know, you have to make people aware of what's happening and you can't, you know, there's, you know, hiding information and pretending it doesn't exist, uh, doesn't really work. And like I said earlier, if the NFL had just stepped up and given lifetime medical benefits to these ex players, we probably wouldn't have any of these problems. But I think what's the bigger issue comes down to is once you're five years up and you're on your own, you know, then guys are having these bigger problems and now all of a sudden they're manifesting and uh, they don't know how to deal with it. They don't have insurance. They don't have uh, you know, a place to go and there's no form of treatments for it. So they're kind of just left out to their own devices and, you know, it's extremely debilitating. Um, just some of the guys that I've been around that I know they're having problems. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a serious deal. Yeah. And the, if the process is that complicated, like, I mean, like you were saying, relatively heads screwed on pretty tight. Like if you already are at a disadvantage because of, let's just say trauma to the brain, if, the, if there's no ABC get to D, then a lot of people aren't going to benefit from the treatment that's out there. Well, and, and the other thing too is um, I think a lot of players, uh, you know, having been in the NFL and, you know, these Superman-esque, you know, players on big and strong and this, and now all of a sudden there's this, uh, you know, this kind of gradual changing. And I think a lot of guys either don't want to admit it or just kind of, you know, ignore it, which is, you know, what you kind of tend to do with injuries in the NFL. You're like, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I was great. I was like, you know, if you want an injury to go away, just ignore it. It tends to go away. And I think guys have taken that same approach or they just, you know, we're too prideful or don't know how, or, you know, hopefully this podcast will give people at least a little bit of beacon of hope and uh, as trying to find people like Fred or people that are offering treatments or really just how to navigate this whole thing. And I think that's really, um, you know, we know the settlement's happening. We know that the concussion lawsuits out there, if you're a player uh, and you don't know, you know, what's available to you, then, you know, you're really at a disadvantage. So having Fred on, uh, you know, for me personally was, you know, kind of a motivation to not only put something out there where guys could, come and listen and say, Hey, Fred, you know, I'm having problems. What do I do? Yeah. And, and this is great because hopefully, uh, you know, I, that's what I'm here for. And I talk to players seven days a week. I, I mean, uh, so yeah, I encourage anybody to reach out to me and, and I'm available. Uh, you know, you got to go back and, and John, what you said is, 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 is very good. And, and that, Here's here's the nature of this insidious disease, and, you have, and if you understand it, uh, it's almost like there's nothing we can do. And, and the point you made about you know why did we do it? I'll, I'll, I've talked to many many players about this, but the, 
the fact is is that when you through our whole football careers it didn't this doesn't relate to you know uh, the NFL totally but anytime we got a, a high impact collision there are there are these brain fibers that everyone are born with it's called tau protein and it's in our brain okay and these in these in these proteins are are housed in these minute fibers that one run through the brain. So the process, and I'll explain it quickly, once we get a high impact collision, that protein is released. So it's it's basically exploded into the brain and it's it's floating around the brain like uh, maybe a visual uh, thing could be like a Pac-Man. You know, it's 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 searching and searching and searching. And and what the tau protein does is it searches for something called brain fibers. Now this gets back to the, the basis of my treatment, okay, and these these tau proteins they basically go in and wrap around brain fibers. The brain fibers are the brain fibers that control the behavior. So if you see that, you understand the behavior of a lot of these players who committed suicide. That downward spiraling. So that tau protein kept wrap, wrapping around brain fibers. So every time we got a, a concussion or a high impact collision, it didn't necessarily have to be a concussion and tau protein was released, it, it just, once it started, once it was exploded into the brain, it didn't stop until it wrapped around that brain fiber, and it'll never go away, okay? Now, the problem we've had from a scientific standpoint is there, there is nothing, to my knowledge, that whether it's an MRI or any type of scans that can actually pick up brain uh, tau protein. So the only way we can see tau protein is at autopsy. So in knowing Bob Stern and seeing his whole uh, process that he, he does, you see these uh, autopsy pictures of, of players who uh, their brains are filled with tau protein, all these brown blotches that are, that are in the dissections of, of, of the autopsy of the brain. And normally a brain is basically white. So when you've seen the results of these players who have committed suicide, uh, you see all these brown blotches all through the brain, the cross sections of the, of the, uh, the anatomies. And um, that's the tau protein. So once it's in, we're going to live with this for the, rest, for the rest of our life, okay? The problem is it is a, uh, a disease that... Uh, you know, progresses uh, into uh, a downward spiral over time. Uh, we don't have, we haven't been able to control. Uh, I've seen guys at 35 years old that I'm working with and helping on the lawsuit that have full-blown dementia, that, that, are, that are committed a qualifying diagnosis of 2.0 advanced dementia. And they're 35 years old, okay? But, so um, it doesn't uh, mean if you're 35 or you're 60 or 70. Okay. Uh, I don't want to cut you out, but uh, that's a great point um, and something I was really curious about. Um, so the effects of CTE, the way they're manifesting is in dementia. So guys, you know, and those of you guys that have never been around, uh, you know, some people or from people that have been dementia, it's, uh, it's pretty horrifying. If any guys have had parents or grandparents go through it, uh, it's probably one of the, uh, you know, worst diseases for the people around you to see, you know, you kind of, you know, basically deteriorating. Um, but how do, you know, cause if you can't test for CTE, but obviously there's a way to test for dementia, what's the process to get guys and uh, test them for dementia? Right. Is it a right. neurological test? Is it a, is it a, uh, uh, you know, uh, interview? Is it like, uh, you know, flashcards? Like what's the process? Well, they, okay. And, and again, uh, to, to, uh, you made a point, you know, I've always said that, uh, that, that wives, children and families closest to us are the ultimate witnesses of this disease. Um, and, you know, in, in my work with players and with doctors and other people that are helping players qualify for the lawsuit, um, I impress upon players that uh, their families and, and loved ones uh, are very important in them qualifying for this process. Because the, the you know they could play a huge role in in you know 
telling these uh, neurologists and neuropsychologists who are responsible for qualifying players, you know, the nature of their behavior. It's very important. But to answer your question about, about how to, you know, what has to happen here, there's only really, unfortunately, uh, one thing that can happen. Now, players uh, who say they are, are, may not be interested in the concussion lawsuit, I mean, there are many ways that they can go out and get diagnosed for dementia, okay? They can go see a neurologist and, and, and they can be under the care of a neurologist. So what I'm talking about specifically is players with, with, who think they have this disease uh, and they want to qualify for the lawsuit because certainly it's their right to, to uh, do this uh, given the circumstances of their careers. Um, this process is very specific. And uh, I'll give you a quick example. When I first started out five years ago, there was something in place called the 88 plan. Uh, the 88 plan was really, as far as I knew, the only benefit that a player could get from the NFL if he had dementia. So the 88 plan, uh, simply put, is sort of a glorified, very great insurance policy that if players can prove they have dementia, according to the standard of DSM-5, then um, they can qualify for the 88 plan, which is a lifelong benefit and now it pays up to $130,000 a year. So back five years ago and forward, uh, I was spending a lot of money out of pocket to treat players, uh, a lot of money on research, and I thought that by qualifying players in the 88 plan that it could help pay for some of these expenses for players. Not only, so if we got them in the 88 plan, not only would it pay for treatment, okay, which was very important for the quality of their lives and everything else I was trying to do, but it would also provide a $130,000 a year insurance policy that they could use for anything relating to this disease. Uh, and, and the 88 plan, I, I must say, is there are great people that are working with the 88 plan for us and are doing a, a tremendous job. The problem is, how do you get in? So back five years ago when I started this, you know, I worked with doctors and paid for medical exams for players. And I guess I assumed that in the beginning we were a little naive, but um, I used to go to, I, I, I still do. I went out to Denver and San Francisco about three years ago, uh, recruited about uh, 60 players who we examined and felt that they possibly could qualify for the 88 plan and be part of a clinical trial study we were doing. So uh, paid for all those exams to get done and uh, then um, submitted applications to the 88 plan. It was my first experience with the 88 plan and all 60 players within three days were rejected. So then I said, well, uh, that's strange because I've got I've got neurologists examining these players who are saying they definitely have dementia and the 88 plan just rejected them based on the, their answer was based on the doctor. That was the answer. So we got 60 letters that said the same thing to every player. You're denied uh, the 88 plan benefit based on the doctor who examined you. So then I said to myself, something's going on here. So, the, so then I learned what what has to be done to actually qualify a player medically for the, the 88 plan and the concussion loss. Now my, my theory back then, knowing that this lawsuit would, would eventually settle, knowing that a player would get money out of the lawsuit if he could prove he had dementia. So the same proof was for the 88 plan, and then eventually, if it, what my feeling was, if we got a player qualified for the 88 plan, then he would be guaranteed money out of the lawsuit. It's, it seemed logical. Same standard. They had, he has dementia. He proved he had dementia to the 88 plan, so then filing for a, a settlement in the concussion lawsuit would have been a slam dunk, as far as I'm concerned. As it turned out, we went through this process and learned a lot about that. So. We know what it's going to take for a player to qualify for the lawsuit, and that and that involves 
seeing, uh, and there are some dates that are important that players should know now, but prior to January 7th, before the lawsuit settled, the player could seek an independent exam. So I was working with doctors, getting players in, and these doctors were, we knew they had to be board certified because of all the rejections we had gotten through the ADA plan. So we figured out that it, the doctor, whether it's a neurologist, a neuropsychologist, needed to be board certified, or the ADA plan was gonna reject them, in my opinion. Uh, we also knew that what we were seeing uh, back then, uh, we weren't seeing much about the lawsuit anyway, but you know, uh, we, we knew that the path we had to take was with board certified doctors, so we did that. And we had, we had success. Now, prior to January 7th, which is what is called the effective date of the concussion settlement, it's a big date because a lot of things changed as of that, that date. So prior to that date, players could actually seek out an independent exam, okay? And if they went to board certified doctors, their chances of getting approved would be better, okay? rather than just seeing a, a, uh, just a, an MD or something, okay? So it had to be board certified, we knew that. And that's how I directed players to see doctors who were board certified. And there are quite a few players I've worked with uh, prior to the date of January 7th that have qualified for the lawsuit. And they will be able to submit claims now to the claims administrator, Brown Greer, uh, March 23rd players can start submitting their claims. So players who got qualified prior to January 7th, really to me, um, were smart and have, have, if there is an advantage, they have an advantage as far as they can file their claim, they've received the baseline, which is the critical part of this whole process, is the baseline. Uh, the baseline exam drives everything. It, it tells, it it'll tells a player if he's gonna qualify or not qualify for the lawsuit. He's going to get money or not get money, okay? So the baseline is critical. And the only thing I can say to players is until they get the baseline exam, nothing will happen. So let's go back to the January 7th date, important date for all of us because everything changed as of that date. What, what, the, what the effective date meant was that players after January 7th can still seek an independent exam, okay? But it carries a 10% penalty on their settlement. So what happened at, after January 7th is there's something called the baseline assessment program that basically now controls the examination process for players. And what it says in the, in the settlement agreement is that players have got to see a BAP approved provider. So the BAP system is now being set up for players to get exams. Uh, what, they, what they're saying is they have 90 days until April 7th to effectively get the BAP system up and running, but a player cannot get an examination until June 5th. So they pretty much shut down the examination process until June. Now, if I'm looking, if I'm a player looking on the outside in on this, well, geez, that just delayed me six months. I can't get an examination, or I'm going to get a 10% penalty. Um, I have to see a B, You're telling me I have to see a BAP provider, or I'm going to get rejected. Okay. Um, Fred, what does BAP stand for? Okay, BAP is is the baseline assessment program. Okay. So uh, ultimately ultimately the goodwill here as far as the thought of a of a baseline assessment program was that players could once it was up and running, players could get a free examination. Sure. Okay. So uh, I'm assuming that on June 5th, any player could call what now the BAP needs to be set up. Uh, according to the settlement, they're going into 53 cities around the country to make these BAP doctors available to players. So in June, they can call up and, and get an appointment for a free examination. 
Now, prior to January 7th, okay, any player that got a qualify, got examination, okay, and these exams run anywhere from, let's assume, let's plug a number in here, $10,000, okay, cash to get an exam. So the burden was on the player prior to January 7th to figure a way how he was going to pay for the exam. All right. So what occurred were there were law firms, uh, certain law firms that were uh, talking to players that said, listen, if you sign a fee agreement with us, we'll we'll pay for your exam. We'll, we'll take the risk. If you come on with our firm, we'll take the risk on the ten thousand dollars. OK, for you to get a qualifying diagnosis. So a lot of players did that. And as it turned out, it was it was probably a good move because they put all this behind them. They have a qualifying diagnosis that's acceptable, okay, to file a claim. Fred, you, you know what's crazy is uh, I'm uh, I remember I got hit up uh, and I can't remember who put me in touch, but I signed in the law firm or yeah. the yeah. the case with some law firm, and I have never got any information right. or right. Ever. Uh, been reached out for any baseline assessment. Yeah, and I have a term for that, and I've I've, I've gone out publicly with it. Uh, I call those guys cut and paste lawyers. Yeah. And I've talked, I've had many conversations with players and about this, and they say, you know, I signed a, an agreement with this guy. He's taken thirty percent of my settlement, and all I did was sign an agreement. And I've never heard from this guy, or he sent me a few yep. updates or whatever. So these are all the things what that do you are do? wrong. So, so for me, I mean, what do I do? Just uh, send the guy, uh, you know, uh, basically fire him? Uh, yeah. relieve him of duty? And I think you can. I think you have a right, a right to release him. Now, what, you know, I've looked into this, and, and supposedly this lawyer uh, could, could uh, file a lien, uh, you know, against the player. But I think what's going to happen here, any players who are listening, um, I think that, my opinion, what will happen is if they were with a prior law firm, if they went to another situation where they could qualify for the lawsuit, they didn't have to come out of pocket the cost of the exam, they were comfortable with that attorney, then I think what will happen is if this won't go down, this problem won't go down to the player. I think that the lawyers who will deal with this amongst themselves and settled it so it won't affect the player. So if a lawyer is getting a 20% fee and some other lawyer wants to make, file a lien against the player, uh, I, I'm very confident that these two lawyers will work it out. That's how the process will be. Will well, why be would a player even need an attorney in this? I mean, it seems well, like- Well, um, we can talk about this too. I mean, it, it doesn't even, I mean, the, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, uh, it's kind of like uh, if the lawsuit has been settled and somebody else is paying for the baseline assessment with this BAP group, then why would you even need an attorney? It seems like better just to cut those guys loose and do it yourself and not have to pay the exam. Well, and, and let me explain that. And it's a, it's a great question. Um, uh, but uh, we've got this, we've got this supposed June 5th date coming up. And, and I, I talked to uh, many, many players, okay, seven days a week. And, and since the change here of, of the January 7th date where the baseline assessment program is sort of running, the, running this now, uh, I think there are factors. And again, what I try to do is give a player, uh, John, and when you and I talked, I think basically what you get out of it is here are my options. Here's all my options. So you, you basically, uh, when players talk to me, they – they have a complete understanding of what all their options are. Now they're not getting that information from this any lawyer that's representing them. Well, it's because the lawyer uh, the lawyer doesn't make money by basically making you uh, right. aware of the proceedings right. ahead of you. I mean, it, uh, I could see if it was like a workman's comp settlement where you know you're in there having to fight these bloodsuckers. But if somebody comes up and uh, basically the lawsuit gets settled. And I mean, uh, frankly, um, I was never made aware of the January 7th date or the fact right. that they were right. paying for any of this stuff. So, I mean, 
you know, in reality, these guys, uh, you know, I mean, their responsibility as my client or as me as their client have, have kind of failed. I mean, realistically, yeah. I, when, I mean, because I didn't speak to you until after January 7th. Right. And right. I remember you being like, did you sign up for this? And I'm like, honestly, um, I hadn't heard any of this information. I mean, because one, the lawyers aren't going to want to put it out. Two, the NFL is not putting it out. And right. the only way that I would ever get any updates or know anything about the settlement, because uh, even the stuff in the newspapers was kind of clandestine, uh, was through you. And so when I reached out to you, you were like, hey, uh, I'm like, dude, and here's the thing. I don't bury my head in the sand. I like to believe that I'm uh, fairly like abreast of what's going on. And I didn't know what it was. So what's the, uh, maybe I missed it. What, what's the motive behind holding back on well, the information? Well, I, I think, well, the motive, I mean, for one is uh, players had to come out of pocket and pay the 10 grand prior to January 7th to get uh, approved. And if the guy doesn't have it, the lawyer, usually the lawyer would front that. So these guys are probably thinking like, well, we don't tell them. We don't have to front the money and then this whole thing will settle and then they're, they're going to get a free treatment anyway. Right? So if you think, I mean, uh, they probably didn't want to have to fork out money on the front side. And for the most part, uh, you know, it's, it was super easy for these guys to sign up a bunch of people and maybe send an email or a I mean, I, I got some literature the other day in the mail and, uh, you know, you would think that from the literature that these guys sent me that they were out there with swords fighting these people when uh, that's not true. I mean, this thing got decided, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, John, let me let me just let me just say something here, okay? The, these cut paste lawyers show up at player meetings over the years, wherever they could weasel their way in amongst players when players weren't even thinking about a concussion settlement, okay? And waved a piece of paper in front of them, and and players are at a at a. a, a, a an NFLPA meeting or an alumni meeting, and they're, they're there socially. That's what those organizations primarily are here for. Golf tournaments, have fun. You know, the brotherhood, we get together, and all of a sudden this, this uh, cut and paste guy shows up, and he's waving, hey, you know, we've got that settlement coming up someday. You're not even thinking about it. You're going to need to be represented. Oh, yeah, let me sign it. So a lot of guys just signed it, not even knowing. And then now here we are. The day has come. All these cut and paste guys are rearing their ugly heads, and I'm fighting them, okay? I am fighting for every player, okay? You don't need that. Why should you give this guy anything, okay, bottom line? Now, is there an ethical issue for me here? Nope. Nope. None. Okay? Now, if, if when I talk to players, we have conversations on, I say, this was prior to January 7th. I say, look, What's going on with you? Have you signed a fee agreement with a lawyer? This is part of the conversation in, in trying to give a player, look at, here's all your options, man. You know, every con it is amazing and it's, it's certainly very gratifying for me. You know, I don't make money at this. I don't need the money, okay? I do it because I've chosen this path. But the point is, when I finish with having a conversation with a player, it's almost like they get emotional. They say, you know, Freddie, I want to thank you so much because I never knew this. I never knew. And now they know. Okay. Now they know. And, and, and that's a good thing. That's what the brotherhood is all about. I mean, we fought with each other. We died for each other out there. We know what it's about. Nobody needs to tell us anything. So that's it. So, you know, here's, so these guys showed up and all this other crap. And, and and I could care less, you know. So, but in moving forward, what has happened with the ba since January seven, and now you've got on the internet, uh, you see all these predatory cut and paste guys trying to sign guys up. Lawyers, they were like not telling us this is a true story. Trust me, listen to what I'm saying. They deliberately did not tell us anything, waiting for the lawsuit to settle because they knew the baseline assessment program would take over and then they would get, quote, a, from me, a free pass. In other words, they don't have to do anything. They don't have to pay out of their pocket anything. So if they strung you along for the last year or year and a half, didn't tell you anything, knowing that the baseline assessment program was gonna kick in and, a, and you would get a free exam, Okay, that was that was the deal. Okay, and now, then if you're, I, then if you're I diagnosed, players to see 
if you're gonna, if you're gonna, you know, it's like I always say, if I was in a room with a with a lawyer and a terrorist, I'd pick the terrorist any day, okay, anytime. The point is, these lawyers strung you along. There were there were lawyers and and that, that did the right thing and, and and put up money and got players, you know, tested and they qualified for the lawsuit. Okay, those guys, God bless them. Okay. So but there's a hell of a lot of players that aren't in that position. Well, so the motive well, to I mean, string them along, John, is because they get a, a piece of the settlement. Yeah, I mean, okay. that's, I mean, but but I mean, like I, as I'm thinking about it for myself, I mean, you know, I was never made abreast of this. So I mean, as soon as I get off this, I'll probably hit up Fred and I'll craft a letter and basically mm -hmm. fire the guy and be like, hey, you know, based off of uh, you know this information, which just became light, I was never kept abreast of this, and um, you know, you failed in your, you know, your responsibility to be aware right. of what was going right. on, and and there. Or uh, this is you know, null and void, and all refinements, you know, right. send that a letter, right. uh, which is, is probably the best course of action. Seeing is that, um, you know, uh, like the fa like it, you know, uh, you know, after January seventh, I was like, man, uh, you know, I mean, if I was uh, a lawyer representing these guys, I would have been on the phone. I would have been actively calling and being like, we got to get you in. Let's book these things. Let's do these things. And um, you know, these guys just haven't because one, they're just hoping to sign up as many people as they can, get a big cut of the deal, and any money Once, they don't have to yeah, front. Yeah, so they don't have to front for yeah. the assessments. That yeah, makes from, sense. Yeah, okay. okay and I get and, it, and it also takes time to schedule guys, get flights in here, figure, handhold, and you know, NFL players can be kind of flighty. And uh, you know, but um, it's um, the harder thing is you know. Now that this this settlement, I mean, and, and Fred here, let's talk a little Frank. Now that this settlement is, you know, in the process of going forward and then actually Jan or in June, I think you said, uh, players can now apply to go and be able to get baseline assessed. What do you think the reality of the process, once you get the assessment, to actually be able to get any money out of these people? Because yeah. the one thing which I have, I mean, I've been in seven years, I've been dealing with a workman's comp case in California. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with the, with NFL teams that literally it came and you you laugh at this but um we came down to a neutral arbitrator and the NFL said we will go with uh, we uh, uh, let's pick a neutral doctor and whatever he says is goes and we'll just go off that so my lawyer let them pick the doctor we went to the doctor he gave actually a collaborating uh you know basically evaluation of what the original deal was and then the NFL came in and said no nah, we don't buy it and they deposed their own doctor and now they've set it for trial and I got to go to a trial in, uh, you know, in April in California about this issue. I mean, and we're not talking a ton of money here. I mean, it's, it's relatively, and my lawyers for years has been like, what do you think? I'm like, I oh, will keep fighting it. I mean, it just, you know, if anything, it's just, you know, draining the NFL's money, but uh, getting a dollar out of the NFL after you've retired is next to impossible. So I'm just wondering about what the actual chances of these guys, you know, because I mean, if you think about guys like Kevin Turner and uh, uh, you know, these guys that have had tremendous problems, like what's the chance of any, uh, anybody ever getting any money out of this? Yeah, I'll, I'll address that in a second, but you, you brought up, a, you know, th there have been sort of uh, major, I look at this uh, over the years and major events. Now, you mentioned workman's compensation, and so I could use that as, a, as an example uh, of what you're asking me about the lawsuit. What happened with workman's compensation? Let's look at the history there. In the beginning, players uh, were filing workman's comp claims for, for a while and receiving pretty decent settlements. The, the settlements were in the range of a couple hundred thousand dollars. Um, I, I, uh, what we knew of back then when this workman comp claim, uh, rose its head, rose its, uh, arrived here the, for an opportunity to get some money. Um, we knew that if we played, uh, played in California, that California was the only state that players from outside of California could go and follow workman's comp claim. It was the only state in the country where they could if they got in, supposedly if they get injured in a game in California, if, if I played for the Oilers, if I got hurt playing the Chargers or the Rams or the, the Raiders or something, I could file a claim, workman's comp claim in California. Now, at the time, a lot of players did that. They received, um, you know, some pretty significant settlements. Now, when the NFL saw that, so this is event number one, I call it. When the NFL saw that, what did they do? They said, wait a minute. These guys are getting 200 grand, 225 grand. That ain't right. So what they did was they spent millions of dollars lobbying 
the state of California to stop the workman's comp situation with NFL players. Fred, you, uh, Fred you actually missed a step. Uh, yeah. What really happened or the, the step that you kind of missed was um, actually we can blame on the scumbag attorneys. Uh, right. the players that were actually legitimate players that had played and had, you know, injuries. Like I played in California and had injured, but I was, I was a California resident. So I was right. you know, obviously there, but what happened was, uh, these, you know, guys would go in and they get these settlements and it was, you know, a few a year. And then all of a sudden these lawyers got this bright idea that we're going to flood the system. And they, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. you know, and, and one, one of the guys actually was an ex NFL player and another guy just got disbarred. They went in and they traveled around and sent letters and signed up hundreds of ex NFL right. players. Oh, so this is like the guy who's like uh, gets a car full of people to get rear-ended. And he's yes. like, I'll hook you up. Well, so I mean, to the point where they were filing workman's comp claims for players that had never even played in California, guys that had played one year in the '60s. Uh, as I, I had to go to the you know whatever the workman's comp doctor uh, that they had specified, and I remember I was sitting in there waiting for an exam, and there was a guy in there who was you know probably in his '60s. And uh, he, I was like, you know, we just struck up a conversation. He's like, oh, I'm from, um, I think he said he was from Dallas. I'm like, oh, he's like, yeah, I'm ex-NFL player. I'm out here from a workman's comp deal. And I was like, man, when did you play? And he's like, well, I played in like 71. And I was like, did you ever play in California? He's like, no, no, I never played in California. But this lawyer told me if I signed up, I could get money out of the state of California. So I'm here doing the process. And I think like at that point, it got to be pretty ridiculous. And so like you said, now step two, the NFL spends millions of dollars. They actually, uh, ironically, hired the most or created the most powerful lobby in the state of California to go in and write this whole thing. And the hilarious part I know about that is my next door neighbor, uh, who's big in the fishing industry, hired the same lobby. And I remember he said, dude, I got these badass lobbyers to get these things pushed through. And I was like, man, why are they so badass? He's like, well, the NFL is, is, uh, is supporting its bankrolling. So, you know, they got to be yeah, good. So, so they got to the be good. Side. And then they went through and they did. And ironically, uh, my assemblyman voted for this, you know, to get rid of these workmen's comp deal. And I tried to go down and have a meeting with this pussy. His name's Alan Mansour if anybody's listening, uh, and they wouldn't fucking have a meeting. I'm like, I'm a constituent. I live in your fucking district, and you voted this against uh, or for something that basically hurts me. And this did, you dude, have like a, did you have a posse of tattooed dudes in, like, you know, swinging chains or anything? No, I, and I was like, I want to meet with my assemblyman. And uh, the dude punked out on me, and uh, uh, he's, he's since moved on to other things, but anytime he pops up on Facebook, I fucking slam him. And uh, his uh, campaign manager called me and I like, and he's like, you know, and this is, you know, this was terrible. This was going to cost the state. I'm like, it wasn't costing the state anything. It was costing the NFL. Now by them not giving workman's comp deal, now it's going to cost the state because these guys are going to be claiming state benefits. Mm -hmm. Fucking worst. But yeah, it, it, long story it, it, really, short. You're absolutely right, John. It, you know, it, it's the, it, the ethical, the ethics of lawyers. Okay. And, and in the, in the workman's comp thing, and we'll move on. Um, they made it retroactive. So it was like guys who had claims in for years got screwed. They went thinking they might get 200,000 and like they're in the, they're in trying to settle the claim with the lawyer and the insurance companies in the other room. This happened to me. And the well, they, they, I mean, well they, Grant, you want it or not, take it or leave it. They and booted. You know, two or three years uh so in the insurance company what do you want to do fred uh, well, well i mean uh they i mean there were a substantial amount of people in that workman's comp thing here in california and they booted probably 97 percent of them i mean they tried to boot me and the hilarious part was uh as they were trying to boot me i actually forwarded them a letter that the nfl had mailed me they were like well you're not you know uh you didn't play in California. I'm like, yeah, I did. I played for the Kansas City Chiefs and played twice, three times, four times a year in California. And I've been a California resident paying here. I mean, I sent them my birth certificate, my driver's license. I sent them over actually email correspondence from the NFL and the PA to my California address. And the hilarious part is, is uh, the lawyer uh, for the NFL PA, Ned Ehrlich, is a, a friend of mine. I called him on the, uh, on the phone and I was like, Ned, and he's like, dude, he goes, they're asking for all this information. I'm like, would a letter that you mailed me in California, would that suffice? And he was like, yeah. And I sent it to him and he was like, you're, you're good. And somehow I was able to stay in it. But I'm telling you, they were, they ditched a lot of players. I mean, it, it just, it's, it, it's a deal where um, the NFL is making money hand over fist, over fist, over fist. And, uh, you know, part of the thing with this settlement is they don't have to come out and admit fault. That was the big problem. And uh, the settlement was not admitting fault. They're going to put this money out there. 
I just wonder, you know, uh, how difficult it'll be. I mean, it's kind of like you said, this prop, like uh, the ADA plan or the, uh, uh, they have all these different, you know, benefits that you can get into. But I don't know anybody that's ever got them. Like, I don't know anybody that's ever, I mean, actually, I know one guy that's ever gotten the uh, lifetime disability thing, and that's probably, Kyle, and that's Kyle Turley, and it's probably just to shut him up. But, uh, you know, so I, when, when I looked at this settlement, I, you know, I thought it was, um, you know, it was good to be able to get money to the guys that were really messed up, like a guy living in his car, Kevin Turner, or just any of the guys that I know they're having tremendous amounts of problems. But I just wonder how hard it'll be and what kind of road they'll have to fight to basically get through this. Cause you go through a baseline assessment with this BAP approved doctor. How do you know he's not one of the NFL guys? I mean, they've had, you know, boogeyman doctored witch doctors for years. Like, like look at the guy who was the, uh, you know, head physician and all the NFL stuff. He was like a psychiatrist and he was basically making orthopedic decisions. Yeah. Well, you know, here, here, <laughs> you're going, you're going deep now, brother. Well, you know what? That's what we do. And uh, unfortunately, I don't pull any punches. And uh, I, frankly, I don't really give a shit. Um, you know, I mean, I think the information that we say should be as stripped down and as raw and uh, be able to provide people with as much good information as we can. Because unfortunately, unless you're given the information, you can't make a, a you know, a, a coherent decision. Right. So let, let's let's go to where we are right now. Um, and and uh, I, I want to address one thing um, in that uh, my conversations quite honestly have changed as of January 7th w when I'm talking to players and, and you brought up a very good point, you know, prior to January 7th, my focus was, I know something bad is going to happen here sooner or later. So my advice is get, get a baseline. Get it done now because this baseline assessment program uh, is coming, okay? And I, I don't know what's going to happen once it's once it comes, but now it's, it's sort of this this window of opportunity here to go out and get an examination. I'll hook you up with a guy who it's not going to cost you out of pocket. They're decent people as far as I'm concerned. Lawyers are lawyers, okay? And that's that. Okay, but but let's keep our. I always talk to players prior to January seventh. Let's keep our eye on the ball here. Let's try to qualify for the lawsuit. Now's the best time to try to do it. So however they got it done, I didn't really give a shit. Okay, I didn't care. Let's get it done. So th so that was that was my agenda, if you will. Okay, get it done because you know there's a bit, something bad is coming. So now my conversations after January 7th, now that I know the baseline assessment program has taken over. Now I made a statement uh, in, a, in an email to players. The statement was, in my opinion, the owners are running the baseline assessment program. Okay? And a certain lawyer uh, <laughs> was very offended by that. Uh, and I said, okay, let's see. Who's in control of the baseline assessment program? Since its inception now, no player can get an examination without a 10% penalty. If he even gets an examination, there's a good chance his claim is going to get rejected. Now, is, is that control? Is somebody controlling that? Okay. So, um, I, I mean, yeah, I actually, just, yeah, that feels very controlling. Though. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't just Control. throwing crap up on the wall. Oh, it no, is, no. I, I could detect the sarcasm in your voice. I'm pretty good with that. It's even worse than that. It's even worse than that because uh, <laughs> they basically have eliminated examinations until supposedly June 5th. That's six months. Now, think about that. No player can qualify for the lawsuit for six months. No player can file a claim for six months. And at the end of six months, if this is available, this baseline assessment program, which has to be set up in 53 cities, now players have to call a doctor, okay, who it's has years. qualified for the BAP, yeah, it's years. but is running his own practice. Yeah. I'll do you, while we're, on the, while we're on this conversation, somebody call a board certified neurologist and see when you can get in to see him. You might get in in two months. So now players don't understand this. They say, oh, it's a free exam. Okay, well, fine. But try to get an appointment. So now what, what, is, what is going on? 
underneath all this. Well, it, it kind of makes sense to kind of uh, uh, shit can it and just take the time. The owners are delaying, 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 delaying. They haven't come out of their fucking pocket for one penny yet. Not one, not one cent. And the first thing they're going to come out of pocket is the NFL is going to give Chris Seeger a $112 million bonus. That's the first penny out of their pocket is yeah. to the lawyer who's negotiating our settlement agreement, a $112 million bonus. Try to, try to factor that into your own personal experience. I am like, Hey, you're working for me and I'm fighting this guy over here. And, he, and this guy who I'm fighting just gave you a $112 million fucking bonus. Yeah. Uh, is, it, is that, am I, is that possible? No, you're well, fair. You're going to be fair. You, you worry. You, my family's at stake. My life is at stake. I, I put my life into this game. Okay, and for what? For what? So the NFL can do whatever they want to do, and and so now the 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 we have. I, I got to tell you something. So let me let me just quickly go back to my conversations now with with uh, with players because you mentioned an important point. Why do we need even need a lawyer? Okay, and if players are listening, you know this is a this is a solid argument that I present to them. You don't, you know, basically you don't because I told players that I'll help you get through the process. If you ever get a claim. I know how to file a claim with the claims administrator. I know how to file your application for the ADA claim. So it goes back to what I said here previously a while back in our conversation. If you qualify for the concussion lawsuit, you better damn qualify for the ADA plan, okay? So I'll do that for you for free. If you make it through the claims process, okay? Well, I mean, uh, well now, wait, so now, let me... Players who are, let's say, in their 60s that are, that are seeing a $190,000 settlement or even players that are seeing maybe a $290,000 settlement, I tell them, don't, don't use a lawyer. I'll help you because, you're gonna, number one, you're going to save 20 to 25% of your settlement. So if, if you're at $190,000, okay, and you're paying a lawyer, you know, 25% to do nothing, Okay. I mean, shit, what is that? Like $47,000. Yeah, 47 grand for, for, you know, the cut and paste guy sending you a few emails, a few emails and, oh, and he's got his phone bill too. Cause he might've called you on the, maybe he called you on the phone. No, my guy, no, the guy never called me. <laughs> uh, ironically, I mean, it, it's kind of hilarious. I mean, I, um, uh, I almost, you know, like have forgotten about it. It's, it's, it, the irony of this is I've learned more about it, uh, you know, from you and actually our two conversations and just the email updates. I mean, so I'm not even sure how I got on your email, uh, you know, blast list, but, uh, it's always been, you know, good information and I always kind of go through it yeah. and I always kind of talk to you guys whenever running into ex-NFL players. But unfortunately, um, it, it's kind of a weird deal. Like you run into ex-NFL players and they don't necessarily want to either talk about it because talking about it maybe admits that there's a problem. I think if yeah, you big, big, admit yeah. that you have a problem, then you're susceptible. I mean, but uh, you know, you got to think, I mean, 95% of guys are going to have some issue of uh, some problem, but you know what? Yeah. Like that's a really fascinating part of this. Why is it that, uh, you know, like let's take professional boxing, for example, that you have a guy like, uh, you know, uh, George Foreman versus Muhammad Ali. I mean, two guys that fought at the same time. And, you know, if you meet George Foreman, he's extremely gracious, uh, you know, very intelligent, um, doesn't exhibit any of the problems. And then you look at Muhammad Ali, who, you know, passed away from Parkinson's and had, you know, tremendous issues. So why is it that, you know, because obviously the CT and what people don't understand, it's a protein that's released and then it travels around and attaches to different uh, brain fibers. Why is it that some players exhibit more problems? Whereas, you know, some guys are, like you said, 35 and have full blown dimension and other guys are probably played just as long, just as many hits, just as many snaps that live into their seventies and, you know, eighties and pass away from, you know, natural causes and never exhibit problems. Why is that? Luck. Oh, okay. Luck. Uh, you think it's luck or you think that, 
that there maybe it doesn't like affect well, biological, I, physiological. Well, I'm, uh, I'm thinking like if you play in the game and you hit your head that many times, the protein's going to get released. I mean, it's kind of like you pop a balloon; you're going to you know full of water. The water's going to go out. Now, whether or not that 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 towel affects guys in the in different ways. I wonder if there's other mitigating circumstances or if there were other problems or things they did. I mean, I'm just thinking about it in terms of compounding things. I mean, personally, and I've, I've made this point, you know, privately, I don't know if I've ever made it publicly, but I noticed that the guys that took the most amount of painkillers and the guys that were always in the total shots, the anti inflams and took the most amount of drugs seem to have the most amount of problems post retirement. So, I mean, I, I know guys that were chewing, you know, 7, 10, 20, you know, Vicodin, Percocet, I mean, every painkiller they can get their hold of. And then I knew other guys that didn't take anything. And I, you know, and not to say that, you know, one is a causation, but just, you know, just me, knowing guys and knowing what people took in terms of the, uh, you know, their pharmaceutical, you know, pursuits, those guys tend to have more problems. So I wonder if it's something where, uh, you know, the guys that took the most painkillers were more susceptible and couldn't deal with the pain, you know, whereas other people, you know, tended to deal with the pain in different ways. So is it pain receptors? Is it, uh, you know, was it environmental? Was it, uh, uh, you know, like I'm sure there's a million different things, but I just, I keep going back to this idea is why, you know, and I, I saw this when I went, when I was in the Dr. Amen deal, uh, I went to one of the support groups and there was a guy who was in his mid thirties that had dementia and I was 32, 33 at the time and this guy was only a couple years older than me and i remember uh uh, you know sitting around talking with people and then you know and then being like well you know have you exhibited any any problems and i'm like no i feel really sharp i mean i read i I do all these things i mean you know and uh they were a a little confused by it and i remember one of the guys like well why hasn't it affected you the same way and uh i I really didn't have any answer for him. So I, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm punting this to Fred, who's obviously, you know, much more, you know, well traversed in this. I'm just saying just, uh, you know, and I don't need science as much as just maybe some observation, but um, have you noticed anything like why? I mean, you said luck, but I, uh, you know, well, really your own luck. You, you brought up a lot of really great questions today, John, but you know, for, just in, in looking at what you just said for many, many, the history of this, this, this conflict, okay, that we've had, uh, that was the excuse that the owners used for years uh, to uh, uh, deny we had uh, dementia from concussion. You guys are a bunch of alcoholics, you're a bunch of drug addicts, you did this, you did that. Anything they could, they could throw up on the wall to deny that we got received uh, concussions, uh, you know, from the NFL, playing in the NFL. So, but I, th- I think to, to, from a scientific standpoint, I'm not a doctor, but I've certainly been around this a long time. What I have seen is, and in, in trying to answer your question, why this guy and not that guy, it, 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 is, a, it is a very insidious progressive disease. Uh, for example, I've talked to players a year ago who, who basically, when we talked, said, you know, I really don't feel anything, Freddie. Uh, I don't care, blah, 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 blah. And a year later, they're they're punching the walls and kicking the dog, and you know uh, it, it hit them. Okay, so I, I, I don't think anybody like I said. Why is it that a 35 year old and a 60 year old don't show the same symptoms? You know, this is for people way beyond me to figure out. But again, it's 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 the nature of the disease. You know, a really um, great uh, uh, example of that was in that movie Concussion. I don't know if you guys saw it, but... Um, uh, no, I read the book, and um, yeah. uh, I forget who the, when the book came out, but I, I refused to watch the movie. It was on on an airplane, and I won't watch yeah, it. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, for, uh, it... There, there, was the a, book, there was a teammate of, of, of Webster's who was yeah. visited him, and... Well, I mean, I, uh, a year you know, later, I mean, he was doing the same thing and he, you know, I forget the name of this guy, but I'll remember in a minute, but he basically got in his truck and drove into the uh, oncoming uh, lane of traffic on a highway, killed himself. I forget who that was. I'll remember his name in a minute, but just, just there horrible. There was also the guy for uh, uh, Pittsburgh, Justin Strezel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Strelzen. He, yeah, Strelzen. Strelzen. Yeah, he, he was the guy. Yeah. And, you know, he was a guy trying to see Mike Webster. 
I mean, you know, it's it's kind of like what we're saying here. He he was he drove in his truck when Webster was pictured in this in this uh, landfill, uh, trying to live out of his truck and trying to help him. And then, you know, the next scene is is Strelzik, uh, you know, punching the walls and uh, uh, driving this fear into his family and running out the door and, and killing himself by driving into oncoming traffic. I mean, I, I, Jesus. So, you know, I, I don't have the answers for that. I, I think what, what we need to try to do is, is, is make players aware of what's coming here. And I don't think it's, it's a, it's going to be, a, it's, going to, it's going to not going to be a good situation. If I think that I see some of these issues um, that we're going to face here at some point in the future, uh, to me, could be another pathway to suicide for some guys. Um, we're, they're living with this disease, and when we get to this to this situation where players are filing their claims, um, and uh, I could see where it could take three to five years for guys to get any money. You think um, basically foregoing the BAP and paying the two percent? I mean, if you shit can your attorney and you said, "Hey, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, circumvent the BAP. I'm gonna pay the ten percent penalty," is probably a smarter, you know, if you think about it, like, "Hey, I'll file it myself. I'll pay the ten yeah. percent just to circumvent yeah. it and to get it into a fast track." Because, like you said, I mean, uh, you know, they're gonna go through and they're gonna drag their feet, and I can't right. imagine how many board certified psychiatrists and, um, you know basically neurolo uh, neurologists are going to want to take on these, uh, this BAP pro bono. It's going to be, uh, you know, they're not actively going out and searching. They're going to probably take guys that are going to apply for it, which are guys that probably don't have a lot of business because they know that, you know, yeah. those kind of denominator. So, uh, you know, some another, another very good question. Another very good question. Not, well, the way I see this, if, if, if you, if I propose the worst, the worst is going to happen here. Okay. I, I would advise players to get rid of lawyers, especially players who aren't aren't receiving large settlements. <clears throat> Why? Because if they're going to wait, uh, you know, Brown. I think Brown Greer, who is the claims administrator, I have researched them. I have talked to lawyers who went up against them in the BP oil spill, and, and uh, basically. Um, what they have said uh, is very scary. So the, the owners, I think, have, have hired a company that is going to uh, do all they can not to give us our money. Okay, let's let's assume that, and let's assume if I'm if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Okay, I hope I am. But um, it, and I I can get into that technically and all kinds of things, but. So I would say to players who are, who are, you know, 60s, you know, 290, 190, to go this on their own, they can get a free exam. I will help them. This is one of the things I plan on doing in the future. When this baseline assessment program is ever up and running, I'm going to be there for players and, and help them get through this process. And, and keep all the money. If eventually, maybe if you do get it, then uh, don't give it to a lawyer. Keep it. I'll help you. I'll help you get through it. I can do it. It's not. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to, to no. do it. Well, and it's, um, you know, I think there was a feeling originally that, uh, you know, when this thing was in the initial fight that, you know, we need players to sign up for an attorney to basically go get this thing in play. Right. Um, you know, and, and I think there was an uh, initial feeling for it, but, you know, I think if an attorney who's representing a player didn't make him aware of this January 7th kind of, you know, hiccup in the road, I think, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, basically they abandoned their, you know, attorney client, you know, responsibility. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, navigating this, cause I think when we, when we were talking, um, you sent me over a, a chart that kind of showed, um, you know, how the money was distributed. I think it was, if you're younger than 45, it was, a you know, a, a settlement really as you get older, it obviously right. decreases. Um, right. I just wonder, uh, you know, 
knowing the NFL, uh, they have, the NFL is a lot like Vegas. Uh, they don't build these, you know, Taj Mahal and, you know, you know, uh, allow you to charge three 99 for a lobster buffet because of winners, you know, they're built on, you know, not paying out money and, uh, you know, basically squashing the little guy. So as I looked at it, I always thought to myself, you know, uh, I would be, amazed and i would love to meet the first guy that actually gets a check from the nfl yeah but the thing which is great is uh and what i think about every day is about staying healthy and uh eating right and like like, you know exercising and doing all the little things so that i can stay around as long as possible to be a thorn in the side of the nfl just like uh you know they've offered to settle my workman's comp thing many times and i'm like no I'm, i'm fine to keep fighting this thing and my lawyer laughs he's like he's like most guys would have tapped out i'm like yeah you know what but uh i just rather just you know bother them uh and uh because you know like i know the one thing they don't want to do is spend money so uh if you're going to be in that situation so i think uh not making it easy on them not going away not taking the chump change or the you know table scraps that they want to throw is the way to go um the uh the the one thing i'm really fascinated and i don't want to short change it so i'd like to jump to it is uh the treatments um you know i mean if you do some you know ancillary just kind of you know searching around on the internet when you start looking at ct and brain treatments i mean you know we've had uh you know people everything from uh you know um, know, stem cell but also you know the use of uh you know cbd uh, medical marijuana as a treatment for traumatic brain injury um you know kyle's a big uh charlie's a big advocate uh, with, this, yeah. with the CBD and has, you know, said that it's helped him, which I can attest to as being Kyle's friend. I mean, he was, he was in a dark place and it's definitely helped him tremendously, but, um, you've taken a different deal instead of looking at it medicinally, actually having these treatments. And I think we talked a little bit about, uh, uh you know, some, um, was it, uh, like, a repolarizing of the brain and the, the, uh, well, like it, 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 let me explain to you the, perfect. Uh, yeah, you do it. The, Don't let me hack it up. Um, well, I'm going to, you know, I have three websites and what will happen here is <clears throat> when it's appropriate, when the time is appropriate, players will be able to go to, the, go to my website and, and, and find out where all these, these sources of treatment will be, okay? And, uh, you know, the procedures that will be in place and whatever we can do about getting them treatment. Um, we, we do something in the treatment process where we do something called QEEG brain mapping. And it gives us a very vivid picture of the, the brain when we start treating players. It's sort of the first step in this process of treatment. And it'll identify what's called hot spots in the brain. So uh, this is why this treatment has been so amazingly effective, uh, the process of it. So... Uh, we can we can take the the brain map and we can see the hot spots in the brain and and this goes back to where we had the discussion that when tau protein is released and it wraps around brain fibers okay so we can actually zero in on areas of the brain that uh, affects that are affected we can see them and that's where the behavior comes into play okay so the purpose of the treatment is uh, this uh, machine is hooked up to a computer, okay, and basically there are electrodes that, that are placed by the licensed uh, mental health professional, doctor, PhD, whoever it is that we train to do this, where they zero in these electrodes, which are very, very non-invasive, uh, a non-invasive procedure, the, the power of these le- electrodes is less than a double A battery. So the, there's nothing involved from an invasive standpoint of all. Basically the treatments last about 40 minutes and the player basically sits in a little chair. Uh, many times players will fall asleep. There. So we get to this treatment process. Uh, we're, we're attacking these areas of the brain that are affected, okay? And that way we can get in and basically We have a term that we call unstick these areas of the brain where they're stuck on behavior, whether it's depression, anxiety, anger, sleeplessness, all of of these behaviors, uh, issues that come with this disease. We address all of them with with, with the placement of the electrodes. Trying to keep this very simple. Um, In the two-year study that I just completed, we put players 
through this uh, study where we did we started out we did the brain map then we gave them 24 treatments okay at the end of the 24 treatments we did another brain map okay now that post brain map is where we have seen all of the changes in behavior from the player uh, not only do we show it scientifically, okay, in the changes in the brain map that show all these improvements, but we also have the testimony of the player who literally talks about how he's doing better. Um, this goes down uh, to wives calling me on the phone, uh, crying, saying that we, you know, the, he's so much better. We, you've saved our marriage. I mean, this is this is heavy stuff you know, that we get involved in. And, and so in the study, what we did was we, we did the post brain map and then we brought all these players back every three months. And what we did was we did another brain map. We brought them in, we took another brain map. So what we did was we had a pre and a post brain map. Then we had a three month brain map, a six month brain map, a nine month brain map, a 12 month brain map, and we continued this over two years, okay? And what we saw was absolutely no changes in the brain maps, and that the players who we leveled out behavior-wise have stayed level is amazing. Uh, what we see a lot of times, and there are test, you know, I, I use some testimonials. Can you get into the chemistry of this? I mean, um, you know, uh, like how is it that the, you know, the process is able, I mean, does it effectively unbind the towel from the... Uh... Yeah, we call it unsticking. It kind of unsticks these. In other words, you, you, you can see, I, I hate to use a player as an example, but you, you know players. I'm not going to name players, but you, you know players and you see their behavior. And you kind of say, Jesus, I wish I could do something. This guy is so stuck. He's so angry. He can't sleep. Uh, he, he's, he's getting worse. Okay, so, so the, the simple explanation to this is we have this ability to unstick that. Unstick that anger. Unstick that sleeplessness. Unstick that anxiety. Unstick that depression. It is amazing. Um, uh, I've been very fortunate to have uh, discovered this. So uh, you know, we continue, uh, we, you know, my, my goal is to make this available to players at some point all around the country so they can, they can take advantage of this treatment. Now, again, uh, the experience I've had talking to players, you know, players have said, you know, I felt better when I, when I went in an oxygen tank, or uh, you may say the medical marijuana may be another reason. It doesn't matter to me, you know, uh, what, what they do. Okay, if if they if they can unstick this this behavior using some method to do it, they're way better off. No, they're better off. Their families are better off. Their quality of life is better off. I have I have treated players. I have to tell you, in worst case scenarios, they wouldn't come out of their bedroom. They would they they wouldn't drive a car. They couldn't drive. They wouldn't get in a car. And they, and they're functioning. <laughs> now, Fred, I know you're on really the other end of the spectrum or the, the tail end, is, but are you plugged into any sort of preventative research uh, for, for younger players? You know, uh, yeah, yeah, I am. The NFL is, yeah. you know. Uh, you know what the preventative research is? Don't, don't play. play. Yeah. And, cause, <laughs> but, I mean, uh, like uh, – like it or not, the NFL yeah. is a world stage, and, and what yeah, they're and doing guys are still is, gonna have is the trickle, they're going to trickle down, and ho hopefully there's strides being made at that level that trickle down to NCAA, which then well, trickles down to Pop Warner. Well, it, think but, about this. I mean, if, uh, if you know, like Fred's uh, you know, treatments in that way, I mean, if there is almost like a preventative treatment, and I always thought like, what well, we talked to Dr. Ford about, you know, just the effects of impact on the brain and uh, well, we, high doses of sugar. Well, right? I mean, and that we, there's chemi chemical. Yeah, chemical changes through, uh, you know, not only um, uh, sugar and like the deterioration. You know, I mean, we had uh, Perlmutter on talking about grain Same, brain yeah. that, uh, you know, gluten acts is a way to deteriorate lining and, and reduces the brain's ability to heal from traumatic injury. Uh, Ken Ford, who's our, uh, you know, good friend who's the head of uh, human and mental cognition the uh, uh which is a, a 
a non or a, a for-profit down in Florida where he's a, you know, advisor to NASA. And uh, we've been looking at something like, you know, like ketogenic diets for not only treating cancer, but also, uh, you know, being one of those things. Because if you go back and you look at the literature, the way they've treated most traumatic brain injury over the last hundred years before, you know, the advent of drugs and pharma- pharmacology was using something like ketogenic diets. Mm-hmm. So I always thought that there would be kind of this, uh, you know, melting and in, in, I guess you could call it a different ways of not only a, uh, you know, taking things that are preventative. I mean, you know, you could say, you know, using you know, some form of, uh, you know, they know that, you know, people that take fish oil and have higher amounts of omega-3 tend to, you know, have better brain health. I mean, we know that from Tom Anglodon. I mean, you use something like a ketogenic diet, you know, use something like, uh, you know, Fred's machine where, ketone you know, salts. yeah, ketone salts, but also let's say, you know, a player goes in and, you know, at, you know, post game, they bring the player in and they said, how'd you feel? He's like, well, man, you know, I got my bell rung pretty good. I was, you know, blurry vision, whatever. And you're like, well, you know, you get 45 minutes in the chair. And, um, you know, I always thought that there would be at some point, like some like helmet that I could put on that had some yeah. form of brain mapping or something that would increase the health of, uh, of my brain. Um, I just don't think it's going to be a priority until the NFL fucking rears their ugly head and actually makes it a priority and puts the money forth because unfortunately they have this endless supply of potential new people. Yeah. And, um, the you fame know, game, man. The fame well, game's hard but, thing to turn down. Well, yeah. I mean, and, and the minute you exhibit any problems with this, you know, then, hey, you know what? We're going to get somebody in here who's younger and cheaper and dumber and not ask as many questions. <laughs> so, I mean, but that's the nature of it. And they just have this endless pool of guys to chew up. So, I think, uh, you know, most guys, I mean, and the, the, the thing which uh, kind of pissed me off a little bit was with the NFL and just these people being like, oh, this is things that only happen to guys way down the road. But yet we know that's not the case where, uh, you know, that kid who was uh, at the Kansas City Chiefs, you know, killed his girlfriend and then showed up at the facility and and shot himself. And they took him in and he had a severe CTE. And uh, And he didn't have a lot of snaps, right? He was a rookie. I think he was a rookie or he's going into a second year. And they've had it and they found it in high school kids. So I, I think this problem that we've pushed down the road and said, Oh, this just only happens to old broken down 70, 80 year old yeah, NFL players. Who are bad, yeah. Yeah. Who, who played in the deal where they were, you know, fucking leather helmets and this, and, and, uh, it's not the case. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I really think that, you know, this problem and the problem is you can only diagnose it after death, yeah. you know, and it's a kind of POD deal. And, uh, I think almost being able to do, uh, you know, understand the process and then being able to put some safeguards in place, you know, I mean, uh, I have a little boy, uh, you know, I have a son and I would imagine someday who will want to play football and you have to be able to make that decision or as a parent, like, how do you mitigate these problems that you know that are going to manifest? You know, is it a, is it a training thing? Is it a nutrition thing? Is it a sleep thing? Is it a recovery thing? You know, what's all of them or it's, it's, it's all, it's all of them or cutting edge progressive technologies like Fred's working on. Yeah. Well, that's why localized these localized. That's why if my son wants to play football, I'm going to go kidnap that machine that Fred has and bring it to my house. Yeah, well, it, you know, the, it, it's interesting. Uh, you know, you hit on something, you know, and, and, and pretty much all all the conversations I've had with players, it's, uh, it's kind of like we get on this one subject. Um, you know, our generation, John, uh, I think today's players are, I think the NFL has finally made the themselves from their own greedy standpoint aware of the value and uh, in in, that's only based on the money they're paying players today so there are things in place to protect their asset that's 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 what's in place today for players who are in the NFL they're protecting their asset the problem in our generation for all the players through the, through the 70s 80s and, be, and beyond until you know today's player in the changes that have been incorporated, which is only recently, um, the the reason why we went back into the game, the, the sole reason, and I think you'll agree with me because every player does, was not a fear of concussion. It was it was basically a fear of losing our job. The nature of the game was such that. Well, back in the back when I played in, in the seventies, in late seventies and on, uh, God forbid you made money. I mean, if you if you were making more money than anybody else, your fear was all of a sudden me being a running back or you a tight end, and some kids coming along and making the minimum at nineteen thousand or twenty one thousand, and you get hurt, 
and you come out for a play, and that running back goes in and breaks a long play, and, and when you should have, you could have done the same thing if you were in there, and all of a sudden you're saying, oh, shit, now what? And, and the owner's sitting up in the box says, boy, I can get rid of Willis, and I can get this kid for 19000 I mean, that's, you know, look, that's we, – we, we went back and exposed ourselves out of our fear, our pride – of, of losing our jobs, losing, you know, that was our life. That's why our brotherhood is so strong. We all understand this. And, and you know, uh, if I'm going to be exposed or people are going to come after me because I speak for the brotherhood, fine. Let them, I don't care. But, you know, I can deal with it. But So, you Fred, know, what type of, what type of yeah, people are coming real, after you? What are they saying to you? I mean, I mean, uh, uh, no, I mean, like, is yeah. it just people who are like, "Oh, these guys should know better." Well, they're getting paid a bunch of money. No, there, there, are, there, are, there are lawyers that are that are trying to shut me up. I mean, oh, on that side of things. Okay, well, I see yeah. what you're saying. So, like minivans, like uh, like dark minivans, are showing up in front of your house. <laughs> no, so, uh, they, I, ironically, they're, they're, uh, they're more, actually, they're doing more than that. It's we, costing, uh, I, I, it's costing ironic, me money to defend myself, but I've got good lawyers, so I'm all set. But. Well, uh, the, and the thing is, I can afford it. <laughs> so it's well, the the irony of this is, uh, we uh, we we work with a lot of military guys, and uh, you know, taught yeah. a lot of seminars and travel in those circles. And I remember uh, we made a joke about uh, SUVs. Uh, like, yeah, bl- yeah, bl- black SUVs. And the guys like, uh, don't worry if you see SUVs now. If a bunch of minivans show up, then be worried. He's yeah, like, varying colors and yeah. styles, maybe <laughs> a late model. <laughs> yeah, late 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 model, dark colored minivans, uh, varying yeah. colors and styles. Then be nervous because that's the dudes. That's the real players. So it was, yeah. uh, it's kind of funny. We're always like dark minivans. He's like, yeah, dark minivans. So, well, I, let me, let me just sort of lay something out for you guys. I, I think this was a great, great conversation and I'd like to get the message out. However we can do it, you know, sure, of course um, I'm available to players, but here's, here's what I think we could talk about down the road, because I think there are some things ahead of us that are going to be very important to get a message to players. And they are, um, Let's look at the BAP, the Baseline Assessment Program, which is now the only option a player has to get an examination, basically, okay? And the fact that lawyers are off the hook. So the, the idea of players uh, getting, finding lawyers who are going to step up and pay for exams now that was, that was going on prior to January 7th, okay, is, is, is gone. These lawyers are gone. There's, there's not going to be situ- – very rarely are you going to find any lawyer now who's, who's going to go out of his way to pay for an exam for a player because he doesn't have to. Because, again, it's that free pass I told you about that lawyers got. And, you know, all the, the cut and paste ones are rearing their ugly head. Now to hold players to fee agreements, we've had that discussion. So but where are we now? So – we have this claims process ahead of us. We have this company, Brown Greer, who was appointed um, by somebody to be the claims administrator. And they're going to handle all the claims. Brown Greer is a huge company. Uh, they they handle the, uh, the BP oil spill. They represented... Um, you know, uh, the BP oil spill. I've no, talked they're, to law, they're firms, big time. The law firms that uh, represented plaintiffs in that case. Uh, and it's it's very scary what uh, Brown Greer has put those those plaintiffs uh, uh, in. Uh, uh, this, this lawyer that I did talk to, very active in this case, said that it's five years down the road and, they, and a lot of their plaintiffs still haven't seen any money. So when I hear that, I say, wait a minute, it's the same company, Brown Greer, that the players are going to try to get claims out of. Should I anticipate that we have a long haul here to get our money? Yes. Uh, I, is it realistic to think that? Yeah, yeah I, 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 um, Fred, I, I mean, the part of the thing, and, and I, I make no illusions about this, uh, the NFL has not got rich paying people. And if right. they brought in Brown Greer, I mean, you can yeah. just do a little bit of Google searching. I mean, you're going to need like an Aaron Brockovich type deal. I mean, these, you know, I mean, they are deep seated in these, uh, you know, major, major, major uh, litigation, you know, funds and this, and there's all this bureaucracy in here. And, you know, their deal is uh, we're just going to outweigh people and hopefully that they die. 
I mean, yeah, that's, that, well, they've that's always done that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that that's what they've done. I mean, if you look at like, uh, you know, seatbelts or you want to talk about, uh, you know, smoking and tobacco, I mean, all of these major, major, you know, uh, landmark uh, cases that, you know, they end up sending up these funds. I mean, it's um, it's next to impossible to collect because there's just so many red, so much red tape, so much bureaucracy that either people get frustrated and they go away, or they just end up dying or just tapping out of it. And um, right. you know, and I think, as I've said before, uh, you know, as a ex NFL player, the best thing you can do is one, like, don't ignore anything. You know, keep training. You know, keep working. Find a way to continue to to do this. Don't let your weight get out of control. Like you know, like you know, go see a doctor. Stay as healthy as you can, so you can stay in the fight as long as you can. Because unfortunately, uh, you know, this is going to be a heavyweight fight. I mean, the NFL, you know, put this thing together with no intent of ever paying anybody. And uh, yeah, but it, but I got to tell you guys, all due respect, I'm doing something about this. Oh, I know you are. So say, let's say for conversation number two. Here, here's the, here are going to be the topics. I'll throw them at you now, um, which I am working on, which I'm working on right now. Okay. I've been working on it. So um, I'm going to meet with a law firm out of, out of Miami next week um, and find out more about uh, Brown Greer. Okay. So I'm going to have some information available. So, so players right now, this, what players are thinking is, well, I'm going to get an exam you know, my advice as to how to get that exam, you know, is pretty much exhausted because the options are so limited now. You can do this or you can do A or B. That's basically it. Okay, decide what you want to do. I don't, in cases where you don't need a lawyer, you can do it. You know, that's my advice. So we, we did. Now, the next hurdle is, is where, where are we going to go? If we, if we do qualify for the lawsuit, the next step is to file a claim, Okay. So they're going to file the claim to Brown Greer, okay? And that process is going to go through. Now, what players don't know, which I am working on right now, uh, and that information I sent you, here's what's going to come off the top, okay? So players are thinking, uh, I'm going to get a $500,000 settlement. Well, I'm going to pay 20%, 25% to the lawyer, okay? That's gone. Now... The next big hurdle that players know nothing about. Okay, well, and let's say, uh, let's let's just keep it simple. Twenty-five uh, percent to the lawyer, five percent to Chris Seeger for, to pay his law his law firm money down the road. Whatever that adds up to, multi millions of dollars in his coffin of our money. Okay, so he can continue doing what he's doing, getting a hundred twelve million dollar bonus plus his 25% fee to represent players. He represents hundreds and thousands, thousands, I don't know how many players, but for him, enough is not enough. He wants to be in control, okay? Now he's gonna take 5%, okay? The second thing that players are gonna get whacked with, that they're not even aware now that we have to make them aware, is the lean resolution process, okay? Now, Who's in charge of lean resolutions? So you know what a lean resolution process is. When players, like if you were to get an award from uh, a, a court, uh, all of a sudden people are going to start filing liens uh, and judgments against you to get money. It's called lean resolution. Okay. In the case of the NFL players, there is going to be a lean resolution. Now, what next comes off the top is any player who is has Medicare or Medicaid, the government is has a formula that the uh, lean resolution administrator is going to use an equation to take that money automatically out of the settlement. Let's assume it's 5%. So the government's going to take money. That's a given. Okay, so now you got the lawyer, you got Seeger's five, you got the, the health care lien, which is another percentage coming out. So any player who's on Medicare and Medicaid, they're going to get whacked there. And then the player has to defend against the rest of the liens. 
child support, judgments, tax liens, you name it. They're all going to rear their ugly heads. So now when a player thinks, geez, well, I'll pay a lawyer 20%, and, that, and he's figuring out in his brain what he's going to get, that's going to happen. Then, a factor in these predatory lenders who have gone to players who have qualified for the lawsuit that have lent the money. Oh, dude, don't, don't even get me started on this. I got I'm contacted. Tell, no, no, let no, me finish. No. Let me finish. Oh. This is the message that has to go up. Okay? So, 3% a month, whatever. By the time... If, if, if you want to make the statement that Brown Greer is going to screw every one of us and, and drag out any type of settlement we're ever going to get, can you imagine these guys who signed these agreements with predatory lenders, by the time they see their money, they will have no money? The, the, uh, I got hit up by a uh, – actually, I've been hit up numerous times by people, and I actually met a guy who – was who is in the settlement that took uh, I think it was about one hundred and fifty thousand dollar cash payment from some right. uh, somebody right. that was fronting him money against this and he's like oh we're you know people are getting paid I'm like dude they're not getting paid uh, the settlement has did oh well this law firm and this you know these are paying right. out of this and I'm thinking to myself I'm like wait a minute wait a minute. so basically you're taking a front on uh, them potentially I'm like dude like this is the worst idea you can ever imagine I'm like the one person one thing one people you don't want to owe any money to is the law firm especially people that are fronting that money which they're not they, they brought in probably some uh, somebody else to bankroll it but uh, well, these are, these are then, the lawyers these are the lawyers that are out there you know let's talk about, about ethics I mean the lawyers are the ones that are getting a piece that action to get a player well, to it, yeah it's uh, it's it's uh but I, I and then ironically i got an email uh and i forwarded it on to the pa uh being you know uh, basically saying exactly this and i forwarded it on to the pa and i was like this is fucking this is terrible i'm like this is uh uh the fact that this is out here and, and i they somehow got my email because uh and the hilarious part is the email that they sent it to was uh an email that uh, i only use for the nfl pa and for the NFL. So I had an email years ago and that's the only thing I use it for is that. And it came to that. And I thought, and I sent him an email like, Hey, stop selling my fucking email address to these fucking yeah, 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 and, right. and I was like, somebody in your office is giving up fucking emails to these douchebags. And I was like, and this is fucking illegal. And then I got a call back from the end of the, you know, Oh, can you do this? I'm like, this is bullshit. Like stop putting people in this situation. I mean, guys are desperate. They think they're never gonna get money. So next thing they, they fucking make a deal with the devil. And I'm like, dude, this is, this is crazy. Well, you know, again, you, you've got the lien resolution process and, and players, you know, I've, I've, I've come out, uh, you know, I'm afraid to say it, but, you know, uh, they took, they basically, uh, the argument in, in selling out what Seeger did to sell us out on CTE, literally, and I don't think players know this either. He he sold us out on this issue of CTE where the, they've taken it off the table. So if a player kills himself or if a player dies uh, and sends his brain to Bob Stern at Boston University for him to do an autopsy, discovery he had CTE, he would his family would get $4 million. So in Seeger's words, this was, we stopped the pathway to suicide, okay, by eliminating uh, CTE from, from the settlement agreement. So any player prior, well, any player from 2014 on, and there are many who committed suicide or has died, their families will get nothing. Zero. Yeah. So it was, uh, and I, and I, I think they exclude people out of the settlement, like, uh, going forward. I mean, it was like, a, uh, you know, like it's the one thing yeah. which kind of drove me crazy too. in this whole potential thing is that nowhere in there, is there an admission of guilt? Like that the NFL actually did something nefarious to, so come they, they, to deceive they, people. Seeger gave them that too. He, yeah. he, you know, he made it so they don't have to admit to anything. Well, it, but all that was, you know, 
yeah. under the guise of we got to get these guys money. You know, guys like Kevin Turner need money. This we got to get this thing. You know, this will help grease the wheels. And all they did was fucking you know make a deal with the devil for his thirty pieces of silver. Let me let me tell you, in my opinion, in my opinion as of right now, you've got three classes of of three subclasses that are part of this lawsuit. <clears throat> You got subclass one, which is players prior to 2012. That group is made up of, <clears throat> of um, say, uh, Dewerson, you know, all the guys in suicide. From 2012 to 2017 is subclass two. So th this is us. These are all the players who are part of this lawsuit that uh, either have qualified or haven't qualified. Okay, prior to January 7th. I call subclass three is players from <clears throat> January 7th, 2017 and beyond. So these are players who now come under the auspices of the baseline assessment program. Now, in my opinion, what I think is going on in the baseline assessment program, and I, I know when I say this, uh, uh, anyway, I believe that the reason they haven't announced approval on doctors so players could get go out and see a, an approved BAP provider tomorrow and get an exam and not get a 10% penalty, okay? I mean, they, they could they could start saying, hey, we got three doctors in, in San Francisco. We got five doctors in Dallas. They've submitted their applications, okay, January 8th, the first day they could submit applications. And we've approved them on a, a first in, first out basis. And guys, you can go get an exam and you're not going to get penalized, okay? Now, you can't get a free one yet until June 5th, but if you want to get an exam, you're not going to get penalized. Fair enough. That's reasonable. They haven't announced any approved doctors, period, as of today. <clears throat> okay? And what they're going to do is, in my opinion, they're going to come up with a brand new model, which is going to be what I call subclass three. Any player who now gets an exam. And that model is going to be geared. So what they have is they keep, keep this in mind if you can picture this. What they have now is all these good doctors around the country, some of them new doctors, some of them doctors that have been uh, doing these exams that have chosen to become BAP providers, have submitted applications to the, base, the baseline, the BAP administrator for approval. So they're taking in every application. Now picture this. Tell me if, if this is impossible. And they're looking at every application and they're saying, because the doc, on the applications, these doctors who are applying have to provide backgrounds. So they'll say, oh, let's look at this guy in San Francisco. Oh, he's been an expert witness for, def for plaintiffs. See ya. Oh, there's a neurologist over here. <clears throat> this guy specializes on his on his application in malingering. You know what malingering is? Yes, I know exactly what malingering is. <laughs> okay. Now, is this part? Oh, we like him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because, uh, you know, there's a term in the NFL, and a malinger is a guy that uh, fakes injuries and mopes around and, you know, is dishonest about it. And so I've heard that term used before, always oh, a malingerer, which is, yeah. you know, basically a, a faker guy just there to steal and, you know, that. And so they, uh, the NFL was historically great at finding these doctors that were magically great at finding every single oh, person yeah. they uh, uh, analyze as a malingerer. Oh, he's just, I mean, it's fucking, first no, of all. No, I'm just telling you. Now, no, I know. also, they're building the, the, the testing prior to January 7th had uh, neuro, neurocycle, neuropsychs had in, built into the testing, you know, 
an, an address of malingering. So if a player, and I used to talk to players, I said, look, uh, when he, they, because they were, they were nervous. And a lot of times nervousness could be viewed as malingering, okay, in the way they, these neuropsychs, very sophisticated testing, okay. But what I think they're working on is upgrading the neuropsych testing to include more tests to bring out malingerers. So basically what they're saying is we're going to reject you because we think you gained a test. You're gone. Yeah, but I mean, how can you game the test? I mean, I could, could I, the point I mean, is, I've never taken a different It's not players who are going to game the test, John. It's players... If, if, they, if they load up on this issue, it, it, it opens itself up just naturally to exposure to malingering. In other words, if they're really trying to find out you're a malingerer, they're going to they're gonna do it, one way, whether you are or you aren't. So if they take it up another level, which I think what they're going to do, and have these testing in place now with new neuropsychs that are now going to be approved BAP providers, they're going to tell these neuropsychs, you want to be part of the BAP? Well, here's the goddamn test you're going to use. I think, uh, I think the recommendation going forward should be to circumvent the BAP, take the 10% penalty, kick your lawyer to the curb, and just uh, we'll help people. I mean, I'll submit my, uh, my time and my effort to help people uh, navigate yeah, this. I, I, got a, I got a horrible, horrible thing to tell you. What I'm hearing is if you don't get a BAP exam, they're going to reject you, period. So even if you take the 10% hit, they're still going to reject you. They don't give a shit. You do it their way or they're going to reject you. Hmm. <sighs> now you factor in. Here's, here's what I'm getting at, guys. Now you factor in, okay, Brown and Greer. We're going to bust your fucking balls. We're going to take this all the way. We're going to make you fucking beg for your money. Okay? Lean resolution. Players are going to take lean resolution and bad loans. Bang. Half their settlement gone. Right off the top. Now factor in the disease into this. Fucking guys were committing suicide back in 2012 and we didn't know why they were committing suicide. Is, it, is this a fucking another way, a pathway to suicide? And Seeger is saying, oh, the BAP system and getting rid of CTE, stop the pathway to suicide. Bullshit. You wait, know, wait, wait, wait. You've, got, you've got guys that are on the edge. You, you've got guys, listen to me, you've got, this is the message. You've got guys that are desperate for this fucking money. This is their last shot. Last fucking shot, period. There's nothing beyond this. You know, this guy I talked to today, he's living in his fucking car, hoping he's going to get money out of the settlement. But what am I supposed to tell you? Oh, Jerry, you know, I got bad news. You're going to have to live in your car for another three to five years before you see any of this money. Fuck this. This is what's coming. And they want to come after me. Fine. I don't care. But this is what's coming. And players need to be made aware of what's coming. Or bad shit is going to happen. How many guys do you know, John? And you said it to me. I don't give a shit about the money, Fred. I want to be, I just want to get better. I say, well, I'll make you better, brother. I'm, that's what I did. I committed to do that. We'll make you better. We'll try to make you better. So I guess, Fred, what you're saying is, you know, that's a solution to a shitty situation is, hey, the fight's not even close to over for these guys who might be relying on this in a desperate time of need. But with some of the research that you guys are doing, it will here's, at least put here's, here's what I'm doing, and just so you know, here's, here's what my time is spent now. is isn't so much advising players what to do because this is coming, okay? They, they have very few options left as far as qualifying. You know, it's their way or the highway. We know that way. So um, 
what I'm trying to do is I've, I've searched out companies that can talk about possibly structured settlements or, or being in place to make players aware that they may have some options against some of these things that I'm anticipating are going to happen. So, so I'm working on that now. Okay. Um, I've also come up uh, with a, uh, a statistical formula, if you can believe it or not, <clears throat> that I just finished as a hedge against the 10% penalty. <laughs> so what I'm trying to do is uh, convince some people to um, get back in the game with um, paying for exams. And I've created a hedge against the penalty so the player is not going to see any penalty. It actually ends up being a give back, back to the player, if if the doctor qualifies. Um, how are they selecting the doctors from the BAP? I mean, is it do do they have to apply anything out to them? Like how? Like what's the or do we even know the process? Yeah, the process is that uh, number one, uh, you know, they have to they have to find at least I don't know eight hundred doctors, okay to fill up 53 cities. And um, you've got uh, uh, doctors that have been doing exams, have filled out applications. You've got other boards, they have to be board certified. So you've got other doctors who have applied to the BAP. Now, a lot of the good doctors, when I say good doctors, certain doctors who are board certified doctors won't even bother with becoming BAP providers providers because they're going to get paid less money. Uh, the BAP is, gonna, is not going to pay the doctors what they're used to charging for these exams. They're going to pay them less. So then the, the option they put out there is a doctor can qualify to become an MAF physician, which means they're not a BAP provider, but players can see an MAF physician. But the cost of the exam is going to be the, the, the normal cost that they would charge it, you know, normally. So they're not going to take the BAP discount, if you will. So those are the MAF physicians. They haven't been announced yet. But it's going to be okay for a player to see an MAF physician, but now uh, they have to pay for it. Or if they're approved... Um, see, that's not a free exam. The only free exam is the BAP guy. Uh, an exam usually, what would you say, about $10,000 to, to be Yeah, basic? you roughly got to figure around $10,000. 10, I mean, it, you know, the, the, some of these law firms, they, you know, basically the package was, you know, if they had to send the player to a city to, to get – Examine. They provided the travel, the hotel, whatever. You know, so it varied. But if you if you got to factor in around a ten thousand. But with the BA, like I went to uh, doctors at Brigham and Williams, uh, woman, excuse me, Brigham and Woman's in Boston. These guys were very good. Um, the cost of mine was like twelve thousand. Uh, and they, they're, they're going to, they're not even going to be even be part of this process. Now, is it, um, is it, is it subjective? I mean, is it a, uh, them evaluating you, them as experts evaluating you? Is it, uh, you know, is there, uh, something they can, I mean, cause the, I always get worried a little bit when you have these things that are so subjective. It's not like, uh, you know, hey, you got an x-ray, you got a broken leg, uh, your knee needs to re uh, is, knee is, I is mean, the least work comp thing is like, you're messed up. You know, we, we have images, you know, there's no way for you to argue this disability. Uh, what I'm worried about is that if you bring in things that are somewhat subjective and a doctor's like, well, you know, I evaluated it in one way, he evaluated it the other. I'm just thinking that, you know, with something like this and without some form of 
of testing or something concrete, you know, I'm just wondering if it's just going to be easy just to find the right doctors to just. Okay. Push guys. Well, well, here's the bad news. The, after, after the player gets through whatever Brown Greer is going to do to them, if they do qualify, the NFL has the right to re review every claim. Is that subjective? I don't think so. That's what I was, uh, yeah, that's what I was afraid of. I mean, it yeah. seems like, um, you know, the... Uh, but, uh, I think the but I think the BAP process, to answer your question, Question: The BAP process is not, to me, in my opinion, subjective because they're going to scrutinize every application and reject the doctor if they don't like him. Sure. Why? Yeah. That's that's the first thing out of the box. Then, if the doctor survives, okay, and they're doing qualifying diagnosis, they'll submit the claim. The player will submit the claim to Brown Greer. Brown then go through the Brown Greer, uh, you know issue and then if they survive it then the nfl sits back when finally if the if the player gets through brown greer some asshole from the nfl looks at it and says rejected sue us wow yeah that's and they got deep pockets and good um, lots of attorneys you see my fear here, and, and you look at the nature, again, I keep going back to, I understand the nature of the disease, and this is not going to be good. I mean, some guys are going to say, Freddie, I don't give a shit. I don't care. You know, it's not worth it. And I don't know. Is it going to be worth it? Oh, it's always worth it. It's always well, worth it. I mean, I think, uh, you know, uh, the one thing which is where I think people, you know, get tired of going through these fights, but I think uh, – I think you got to always be up for the fight. You got to be up for the challenge. I mean, and, and, uh, you know, I mean, it's at the end of the day, uh, maybe you got to take the, uh, I always have to go to literary reference with uh, Beowulf and, uh, basically fight the good fight. And, you know, it's what you're doing. Uh, you know, you're fighting the good fight. You're, you know, putting yourself on a trajectory, which isn't a favorable one from just sounds like some of the trials and tribulations, but you're actually doing something out there to help people and to help this thing along and, and provide, uh, you know, uh, provide guys with information, but it's really a David and Goliath deal, man. And the NFL is, uh, you know, is the fucking evil empire. And, uh, you know, they're, you know, they put this whole thing in play to, you know, and they've set it up in such a way that I think they're going to like, like you said, they're going to, if you're a good little boy and you come in and beg and don't cause any trouble, then you know what, we'll grant you your money. If you, uh, have caused any problems or say anything or do anything or don't, you know, kiss our ass, then you know what, fuck you. We're going to, we're going to yeah. kick you down the road. So, uh, it's unfortunate because, uh, you know, right is right, but you know, it seems like, uh, you know, in today's world, whoever writes the check is right, not necessarily what, what is right is right. So it, it's, well, you um, know, it's the, the sad thing is, is the lawyers who have represented us have, have sort of uh, duped. They think we're stupid. They really do. They really think we're just all stupid. And, and they've explained this, to my knowledge, what I see to date where, ah, oh, don't worry, we, we, you're going to get your money. And da, 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 da. This area, you know, I mean, how can they do it? And then behind our backs and under the table, they're taking $112 million plus 5%. Oh, by the way, I'm taking 25%. Chris Seeger is telling his players that he represents, I'm taking 25% out of your settlement, and oh, you're kicking me back another 5%. <laughs> what the fuck? It's, it's filthy. <laughs> Filthy. And don't listen to that Fred Willis. He's, huh. he's poison. He's, hey Fred, he's this doing is, this for money. <laughs> this is twisted, man. And, uh, you know, I, I guess a message to our listeners, too, even if you aren't a former NFL athlete, try to get this episode in front of – uh, in front of anyone that you know that might be associated because there's probably some people just silently suffering out there. So, uh, you know, with that said, Fred, what, what is the first line of contact uh, to get some information from you or, or where should people go if they want to? Uh, yeah, I mean, they, 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 they can go to, you know, uh, they can Google me, you know, Fred Willis, and they'll, 
you know, they can eventually go to my websites. I mean, you guys could put my cell phone number on on the air if you want. I could care less. I'm 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 ready to talk to as many players as I can. I think at some point, uh, you know, I'll I'll do some email blasting uh, to guys, um, and I have pretty good success in, in getting a message out. Uh, I want to be very careful with the message, though, uh, sure. and I'm working on it. I've been working on it a while because I've kind of been digging deep into what's next here, and I think the next the next big thing is is going to be making players aware of what we talked about today. Right. Uh, and I think you'd have to understand if if I could have had this conversation with with ten thousand players. I think you'd probably know more about, you know, honestly, you know more about what's going on than you did yesterday. Well, I was going to say, Fred, I mean, uh, when this thing goes live and we, you know, because it's pre-recorded, we go back, we edit it and, you know, you know make it, you know, pretty it up. And uh, I think what we should do is uh, when we, you know, when we blast it out on our, on our social media deal, uh, maybe, you know, we'll kick you the links. And if you want to blast it out on your email uh, list. Yeah, I'd love to have this where we could get this uh, interview out to players. I mean, well, I mean, that's, we're going to push it on our network. Yeah. Um, I think the natural thing for you is when you send out an email blast for you to link it up and say, Hey, you know, um, uh, you know, recently did a podcast with X and a yeah. player. Yeah, I mean, put the link on there and get yeah. it out there. And you know, it, again, it's, it's, it's a a, big the, the message here, John, and I, I applaud you for what you're doing. It's, it's a, it's it's not about the lawyers. It's not about the NFL. This is brother to brother. Okay, that's what this is. Okay, when I when I help players, I talk to players. How I've been able to help many players is because I've talked to a player, and then I want you to Fred. I'm going to have so and so call you. Okay, that's how this works. You know, I'm not selling anything. I'm not advertising mm -hmm. anything. You know, and which is a unique thing in this day and age you know yeah, someone I mean, in it for the, the you know we're we're the same we want to do the right thing by the yeah. right people you know and just make sure everybody's better you well, know that's that's the goal yeah i mean and battle the bullshit snake oil out there yeah. like all this, well, this nonsense mission. witchcraft that you're talking about outside of uh these legal representation and right. and these hoops and ladders that that are put in place for these guys who are entitled to a settlement man that's what the court uh, yeah, no, well, I mean, it's, it, it's really the mission statement for power athlete is the idea of battle the bullshit. Uh, you know, I started this idea with, um, you know, just seeing the nonsense that was in the fitness and strength and conditioning community and how much bullshit I saw and how much just was snake oil and not accurate and uh, started right. this program, you know, to be able to provide a beacon of, of not only solid information, but good training. And then this podcast uh, really started with, you know, uh, us creating a, you know, our network and a bigger genealogy and reaching out to people to educate ourselves, and it's just become a very good platform for us to not only uh, introduce people to you know our audience to people like you and um, you know potentially help so I think um, you know when this goes live we'll forward you over all the links and we can you know get you to blast it out on uh, on all your channels and hopefully guys will be able to you know put an hour or two together to listen and basically get educated and then find a way to connect to you and and even reach out to me and see how we can start helping people because uh, uh, you know you don't have to be <laughs> uh, jaded to see that there's a, a, a lot of very, you know, interesting issues with this. And, yeah. um, you well, what, you're right. hundred percent right. And what, what, one of the things that I'm trying to do now is I've had meetings with a number of, uh, I think solid companies that understand my message uh, and these, I'm trying to bring some companies uh, in the, to the forefront here that um, will help players with the lean resolution issue, uh, may be able if, and again, it would be the players' players' uh, decisions on how they will, but make 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 options available to them with what I see coming. Okay, I'm working on that now, mm -hmm. uh, and I've had uh, for the last two weeks have talked to a number of companies, um, checked them out, um, and think that. Uh, uh, they could they could be helpful to what I see coming here, okay? And I'm going to put it out there, you know, the right way, and and uh, say, guys, here's what's coming. You know, talk to these people. They 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 have expertise in lean resolution. They they understand the process, okay? Um, I'd like to get 
petition signed. You know, this guy Seeger is trying to go under the radar here. Read that uh, notice I sent you. But players have to go put, go through hoops to object to his motion to get his hundred twelve million dollars. Have to have to fill out things in writing. That, I mean, literally the way he's presented this. You know, and you know our attention spans are about five minutes. <laughs> they're gonna look at this and they're gonna go, "Fuck this! I, I don't like it." But I, I can't spend half my day trying to answer this goddamn thing. So I had a conversation this morning with a law firm that surfaced uh, that is objecting to, and they're not even part of the concussion lawsuit. They represent players. Um, and uh, I've talked with them about this, and we're working on sort of a short form that we could get out to players where these lawyers would provide a system where, you know, in five, five minutes or so, players could object to the $112 million and the 5%. So oh, be- that's coming. Okay, that's coming. That's going to get out oh, there. All- <laughs> we got to get that out there. But, you know, if, if we get it in front of players – and see what this guy's trying to pull. We don't, and then the other thing is, can you believe anything in the courts? This guy's got this thing. If you don't respond in, in like three or four weeks, he gets the money. <laughs> it takes guys two weeks to read my email sometimes. <laughs> so this guy, is, this guy is pulling one over on everybody. And I'm fighting that fight. We're going to try to get something out there. So however we get it out there, we get it out. But, you know, well, let's hurry up and we'll get that, the best track and, uh, of your and, settlement plus 25% of your settlement plus 112 million bucks. And, oh, by the way, you're acting in my best interest. You negotiated this fucking settlement, okay? Right. So there you have it. <laughs> well, once we get that info, I mean, uh, you know, we, with what reach we have, we'll certainly spread the message. I know, you know, just John, based off of your yeah, ten, I mean, you know, how like, we get it out there, we get it out there, you know, and uh, we owe it to we owe it to contribute to the fight, right? Yeah, yeah like you said, battle the bullshit. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, if, yeah, and uh, you know, Fred's got a good contact list, so yeah, we'll and uh, you know, we'll forward to as many guys as we can, and hopefully uh, get this information and. You know, and if guys need treatment, you know, and, uh, you know, need help. Yeah, we'll and, get to, you know, we'll, we've got the treatment moving and with that's going really well. And, you know, we'll, you know, we'll get some help, you know, get that out there when it's appropriate where guys, you know, we're going to get them through this hurdle first. Yeah. Hopefully a lot of these guys are going to qualify for the ADA plan. And, and then they Is can, it something where if a guy, um, you know, went in and had the treatment on your treatment, uh, would it be? something where he would not qualify so you think like well, you know here's, here, yeah and that again a very good question um what what my concern would be is if we started treating players prior to the the exam the neuro examination it, it could possibly skew the exam so i've been very very careful about doing it that's um, interesting uh it definitely would because if, if we, see, you know, like I said, a lot of times we see players, dramatic changes in players after one session. So we don't, you know, we don't, we don't want to uh, corrupt that process. Uh, and it, it'll be there when, it, when you know, they, they're going to need it sooner or later. So uh, that's how I'm approaching it. That's awesome. Um, Fred, thanks for your time, man. I mean, okay, I think guys. This- Appreciate it very much for having me on, and uh, um, let's see, let's fight the good fight here. See what we can get get done here. You got it, sir. Okay, Thank thanks you. so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Now it's time for you to empower your performance. You heard Mr. Willis. If you want to join the fight, start by sharing this episode with your athletes, teams, and coaches. Also take the time to check out his website, www.hpnconcussionmanagement.com. There you'll find the most recent research findings and the signs and symptoms of concussions. Willis not only helps you identify your brain-related injuries, but provides step-by-step instructions on how to manage and treat them. Until next time, bye!